kingdom of God brings heaven to earth. It leaves culture upturned and the kingdom upright. The kingdom is pure and holy. It is blessed and set apart. It is righteous beyond all understanding. It is generous beyond earning. Our God's kingdom is good news. His kingdom is saving grace. It rattles our reality and shakes us awake. And it pours out of us as salt and as light. It brings perspective that changes the way we think. It brings vision that changes the way we see. It brings growth that changes who we are. It brings surrender that changes how we live. The kingdom is kindness that doesn't feel fake. And the kingdom is patience that doesn't make sense. It is forgiveness when it doesn't seem possible. It is for the poor in spirit, the lowly, and the persecuted. The kingdom is his, his kingdom is ours, and the kingdom of God is here. Hey, Cornwall Church, so glad that you're here with us no matter where you're watching from one of our buildings or from your living room or on your phone or your tablet or on your computer, your TV. So glad that you're here. And you know what's good news is that no matter how divided we are as a world, there's at least one thing that unifies us, and that's Amazon Prime Days. And you survived them this week. Hopefully you got a lot of shopping done, whatever. But today we're going to continue on with the best sermon ever. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and it's the best sermon ever, primarily because Jesus is the one who preached this sermon. When Jesus preaches, you know it's going to be a good sermon. The other reason that I think, one of the other reasons that it's the best sermon ever is while it was delivered 2,000 years ago, it's a timeless truth that is as relevant and applicable to us today as it ever was in the last 2,000 years. And we're going to continue to look at that. But before we go back 2,000 years to that sermon, I want to take you back 50 years ago, circa 1970. Our family had a, a family portrait taken, and I, I zoomed in, so it's a little blurry, but a picture of my brother and I, I know, collectively we say, ah, oh, okay, a couple little red-headed angels. My brother Jerry and I are 20 months apart, very close in age. And most of our life growing up in our early years, we shared a bedroom. We had bunk beds and we played together and we roomed together and we wrestled together and, and did all kinds of stuff together. And there were times, I know it's hard to believe with such angelic young men, there were times when there could be some tension between my brother and I and sometimes our voices might elevate and sometimes a toy might fly and, and sometimes some words might be said or, or some names might be called and, and my parents would come in not only to break up the little skirmish that was going on, but also to try to teach us some things, to have some discipline and to help us uh, grow uh, through these childish outbreaks of, of anger and, and discord. Now, I know it's hard for you to believe that that would happen. At the end of those little disciplinary uh, actions, my mom would often say something along these lines. Now, Bobby, you tell your brother that you're sorry. And I would mumble out with the least amount of authenticity possible that I was sorry. And he said, now, I want you to hug your brother. And with all the warmth of a of a chair, I would go and hug him, and then she would say, now tell your brother you love him, and I would. Now the question is, by saying those words and doing that action, all of which should lead to reconciliation, which should lead to a closeness, a bond, a friendship, a relationship, did it really happen? In that moment, the answer is no. In that moment, I still wish my brother would have never been born, that my parents would have skipped him and gone straight to me, and life would have been perfect. I didn't like him at that moment. Now, I know you've never experienced anything like that, but what we're going to look at today is Jesus addressing that issue with some people that had that kind of an, uh, a problem 2,000 years ago. So we're going back to the Sermon on the Mount. We'll pick up where we left off last week. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look primarily at four verses and really focus on one, Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. And this passage, um, contrary to last week, last weekend we looked at well, it was maybe one of the most familiar, most uh, well-known and memorized passages out of the Sermon on the Mount. This one that we're looking at today is not as well-known. In fact, not many people memorize this one. You don't hear about this one a lot, sometimes because we don't understand it, sometimes because we misunderstand it and we don't like it. But I think when we begin to understand it, when we begin to look into it and, and truly get what Jesus was saying, we will find that not only is it a very beautiful passage, but it also has a key that unlocks understanding to a lot of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. So 
We're in the kingdom culture series, and Jesus talks about this kingdom all the time. In Matthew chapter 4, it says this, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Not someday in eternity out there in a galaxy far, far away. It's not then and there. He says, it's here and now. And the good news of this kingdom is that now, through Jesus, ordinary people like us can experience the kingdom of God. We can live in the reality of the power and the presence of God every single day in this kingdom here and now. And the even better news is that this is the best day for those who are poor in spirit, for those who are not necessarily righteous, that they get to be a part of this kingdom, not because they're poor in spirit, but in spite of the fact that they're poor in spirit, they're invited into this kingdom, and Jesus just opens up this door, and it's incredible as he preaches this good news. Now, as he's preaching this good news of the kingdom, and as he's ushering it in, some of the people, those who are poor in spirit amongst others that are coming, some of the things that are happening, some of the practices, some of the things that Jesus does, some of the things he doesn't do, some of the people he criticizes, some of the people he welcomes, could lead people to draw a conclusion that this kingdom that Jesus comes to bring plays by a different set of rules than other religious leaders. And maybe they had already come to that conclusion, or maybe this is a preemptive uh, uh, attack on Jesus' point to say, listen, I want to make something abundantly clear. And that's where we get to this passage we're going to look at today. I want to read straight through it, and then we're going to come back. We're not going to be able to study it exhaustively or completely, but I want us to read through it. Matthew chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 17. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, kind of log that one away, and heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen by, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So much in here, so good, so confusing at times. And so I want us to kind of jump into it. The first verse, he says this. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now listen, anyone who hears that, that, that this person is saying they come to fulfill the law and the prophets, these things that were written you know, 700 years, 1,000 years earlier, and he's, coming, he's the one that fulfills it, there'd be a little bit of a pushback of saying, now who do you think you are, really? And, and you're saying that you're here not to abolish the law, but they've seen Jesus' life. They've seen the way he operates. He heals on the Sabbath day. Doesn't he know what the, what the rabbis have taught us about doing things like that? His disciples, his followers, they on the Sabbath day, they actually broke off heads of grain and ate them. Don't they know what the rabbis have taught us about that? Like his disciples, they don't fast on the same days that everyone else fasts. And not even John the Baptist's disciples. I mean, they don't do that. And, and Jesus, I mean, there's a woman caught in the very act of adultery and the law says that she ought to be stoned. And he, he says, no, no, no. And, and he doesn't stone her. And, in fact, he doesn't even condemn her. And, and now listen, maybe you didn't come to abolish the law, but before you start talking about fulfilling the law, maybe you ought to start keeping the law. And so they're a little upset about this. As far as fulfilling the law, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because last summer when we studied Moses, in August, the first weekend, I believe, we talked about the tabernacle. The last weekend of August, I believe it was, we talked about the Day of Atonement. And what we saw was that the whole... Um, what the law required, what it was there for, all of it seen in the tabernacle and in the sacrificial system and in the Day of Atonement, all of it pointed to and was fulfilled in Jesus. But it's not just the law. He also talks about the prophets. And as we've seen, and we pointed this out from this side, we see that, yeah, the prophets all point towards Jesus. What they were speaking of, this one to come was Jesus. The original listeners had no idea about this. So when Jesus starts his first 
public ministry, he goes back to his hometown in Nazareth, goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath. He takes a scroll. He opens to Isaiah 61, a prophecy, the prophet Isaiah. And he reads these words, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, to, to um, open the eyes of the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolls up the scroll and puts it away. This is a prophecy about a coming Messiah someday when the kingdom of God would come to earth. They've known this. They've heard this. They long for this. They pray about this. He reads this, and then it says in Luke chapter 4, he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I am fulfilling the prophet. Oh, he said a few other things. They got upset. They tried to kill him. Three years later, he actually was killed. But he came back, and on that Resurrection Sunday, the very first celebration of the resurrection, that afternoon, he's walking with some disciples who don't recognize who he is. And it says this, um, that in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That Moses, the law, all the prophets, all of it points to him. It's all fulfilled in him. And so he says, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Now, while they don't understand this, I would say completely, but I'm not sure if they understand it at all. One thing is really clear is that Jesus holds to an absolute authority of the word, absolute authority of the word. Like when you read through that passage in Matthew 5 that we just read through. He says, listen, until heaven and earth passes away, not, and this would be, not the smallest, most insignificant letter, not the tiniest little punctuation, apostrophe, comma, period. He said, none of that is going to pass, as long as heaven and earth is, until all of it is accomplished. Like Jesus holds the law and the prophets in the highest regard. He says, not only is it true, but it will come true, that it will all be accomplished. And then he goes on talking about how if anyone breaks these law, teaches others to break the law, then, then they're the least in the kingdom. But if you keep the law, then you are, are great uh, in the kingdom. And there's this authority. Not only does he believe and speak that, he has, that the word of God has authority, but he demonstrates it. And he demonstrates it in a way that is very upsetting to the religious leaders. In John chapter one, verse one, talking about Jesus says, in the beginning was the word, the word. The word was with God and the word was God. So when Jesus holds to the absolute authority of the word, it's the law, it's the prophets, but it's him as well. That's why, and we won't have time to go through all this in chapter five, but throughout chapter five, you will see a phrase that looks like this. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. Now, this is taking authority. This is saying, listen, you, you know what Scripture says. You know what the rabbis say about it, but I tell you. Like, he's saying, I have the same authority. I even have greater authority than some of the stuff that you've heard. And the authority of the word is the authority in his own words. And so it wasn't just the interpretation of the law, but his proclamation of the word. And you see this on a grand scale when later he would say these words. He said, heaven and earth, remember he had already talked about that, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus is saying, listen, I have the words that will last for eternity. They are the words of eternity. And let me just say to you, if you ever encounter anybody he says, well, you've, you've heard in scripture and you've heard this, but I tell you, run for the hills. That's how cults get started. Yeah, I know that's what I said, but let me listen to me. Unless, unless you are the word, Jesus, the son of God. And he says, my words are eternal. Now the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were all about scripture. I mean, they had memorized the Torah, the, the first five books of the Bible, that many of you have never even read. They had them memorized. In addition to that, they would begin to explain them 
interpret them, define them, dissect them, and then talk about what does it mean? How do you live these things out? And this became what was known as the oral tradition. So when scripture says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, there would be a long, long explanation of what things you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath of, of their interpretation of what that meant. Now, this oral tradition in, in uh, Matthew 15, this, this is one of those things that uh, we'll have to talk about later, but in Matthew 15, Jesus says to them, why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your traditions? This is what he's talking about. So years later, this oral tradition they had was written down as what's called the Mishnah. The Mishnah had 800 pages, and after that, there were commentaries on the Mishnah called the Talmud or the Talmud, 12 volumes. So they take the 613 uh, commands of the Old Testament, of the laws, they turn it into an 800-page explanation and a 12-volume commentary on this. They were all about the law, and what they come along and say is, listen, you know the law inside and out, you memorize the law, you explain the law, you interpret the law, but you've missed the entire point. And you've missed the one it points to. Jesus said this, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that test about, testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Oh boy, that's not going to go over really well. Because not only is he slamming them saying, you think what you're doing is really helpful. He's saying, all of the scriptures, they point to me. He's claiming to be the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Now, now listen to me closely here. We want you to be people of the word. We want you to read God's word. We want you to study it. We want you to memorize it. We want you to, to discuss it. We want you to talk about it in small groups and with your family and with your friends. We want you here every weekend to, to dig into the word of God. We want that. But it's not just so that you can, can just kind of have this list of things like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. What we don't want is this. Our goal is not that you're a rule follower, but a Jesus follower. That's the goal. And sometimes when we read scripture, we can turn it into this list of rules and we become more of a rule follower than a, than a Jesus follower. Now, some of you I know right now you're saying, cool, then forget the rules. We don't want you to be a rule breaker. We want you to be a Jesus follower, to follow Jesus and to do what he would do. Because if all you have is the law and all you have is a list of rules, then you're not gonna experience the life that Jesus invites us into. In John chapter one, verse 17, it says, for the law was given to Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. Jesus never, ever watered down the truth. And he never, ever wavered on grace. It wasn't a balance it wasn't a split. He was full of truth. He was full of grace. And that's what we're called to do as well. Okay, there is so much more that we could talk about, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of push pause on that right now. What I want us to do is spend the remainder of our time focusing in on this last verse out of this passage that we read. Now, this verse can be frustrating. It can be confusing it can be uh, kind of depressing, discouraging at least. It can feel impossible, overwhelming, and hopeless. I guarantee you this, those who heard it for the first time were feeling those kind of feelings. But when we truly understand it, it is not only hopeful, but it is freeing and full of life. All right, let's look at it again. Matthew five twenty, Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a second. This is confusing. Because wasn't he the one who just said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? Poor in spirit means we're not righteous like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. We don't have that kind of righteousness. And now he's saying that that has to surpass. I mean, the whole good news was that we get to come into the kingdom 
not because we're a mess, but in spite of the fact that we're a mess. And now you've raised this bar. I mean, you, it's like Jesus has flip-flopped on this faster than a politician trying to get votes. I mean, it's just like, are you kidding me, Jesus? You said this, and beside that, I can't do that. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they fast twice a week. They find a penny on the ground, they tithe on it. They know the oral tradition. Now, I can't memorize 800 pages of do's and don'ts. They've got the scriptures memorized. I, I can't... And you're telling, they're so out of my league. And you're telling me I'm supposed to not only run with these big dogs, but somehow I'm supposed to surpass them in their righteousness. This is impossible. I, if that's what it takes, I'm out. I can't do this. But maybe one of the hints is where he says, unless your righteousness surpasses. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. I don't have it. I'm getting it. He said, whoa, whoa, slow down. Maybe what we're talking about is surpassing in kind, not degree. You, your righteousness would surpass them in kind, not degree. Not more of, but different from. Not more of their righteousness, but different from their righteousness. Not adding on, raising the bar higher and higher, more and more. But no, it's understanding that there's a righteousness that's different and better. And when you have that one, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. It's different. That's why Jesus would say, and we'll, we'll get to this eventually, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, not their righteousness. What if? Could it be that while they appear to have this righteousness, their idea of righteousness, their version of what it means to be righteous, the way they live in righteousness, is not what Jesus is talking about? That, oh, it's impressive. And we see that. And we think, wow, that, that's amazing. But maybe they've got it all wrong and maybe they've missed it altogether. Now, if you've spent any time in a Christian church circle, you've no doubt heard the story of Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul. And he experienced this very thing. He was one of the Pharisees. Not only that, but like in the power rankings of Pharisees, he always came in at number one. I mean, he had it going on, and, and there was a time when he's writing to a church in Philippi, and he says, listen, if it's all about me and what I've done and my accomplishments and my own righteousness, he says, I win. I, I've, I've got the bragging rights. And this is kind of where he goes with this in Philippians, where he says, man, I was circumcised on the eighth day. It's like from birth. You know, this wasn't something I came into later on in life. From birth, I was following the law. That was the law. Just to have the young boys circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, I was following the law before I knew what the law was. And I was of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Like, we were one of the, the tribes that didn't, that didn't go off, like the, the other ten. I was of that tribe. And a Hebrew, Hebrew, my parents were Hebrews. So, I mean, like, this, is, this was in my DNA before I was even born. And then, he says, in regards to the law, that's what we're talking about, I was a Pharisee. I knew the oral tradition. I interpreted it. I memorized it. I lived it meticulously. As far as zeal, I mean, I didn't just go for the knowledge. I was persecuting the church. And as far as legalistic righteousness, legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. I had a lot of that righteousness. But what I came to discover is that my version of me-centered, me-produced righteousness was the wrong stuff. And I found out that it's not all about me, but it's actually all about Christ. So he would go on and he said, whatever was to my profit, you know, this self-made righteousness, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I, may be, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. You know, in Isaiah, it, it talks about how all of, our, 
all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. They're like this throwaway disgust. Here he's saying, I discovered that all my righteousness, all the law keeping, all the legalism, all the rules that I did, he says they were like rubbish. Now that's a very kind translation of this word. It's like this was the stuff that, that the farmers spread on their field. That's what, my, that's what my righteousness was all about. And he says, and I considered all lost that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And look at this, be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. He's saying, it's not more of my righteousness. It's different from. It's a different kind. It, it's, it's this righteousness that isn't me-centered, isn't based on me, but it's based on Jesus. And when I have that righteousness, it eclipses the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So while on first blush, it looks like Jesus is asking us to do the impossible, what he's saying is, no, no. When you get the right version of righteousness, the version that I came to give and that I came to produce in, in you, then it will surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, I told you about my brother and I, that I was saying the right things, doing the right things, but something was missing. Something was off. Something wasn't right. And these Pharisees, and these teachers of the law, they had all the laws going, they're saying the right things, they're doing the right things, but something's missing and something is off. And what Jesus is trying to help his followers understand and what some of the Pharisees would learn is that this whole idea of righteousness, it's not just about external you know, compliance. It's not just doing things that look right on the outside. And that's what Jesus was saying the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were doing. And he calls them out on this one. I mean, you talk about really ruffling the feathers, you know, riling up the establishment. Matthew 23, uh, that whole chapter, the first part of it anyway, Jesus just like lays into these guys. And he says to, to the followers, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, everything they do is for people to see. It's like this external demonstration. It's this external uh, you know, compliance to the law, but it's really for other people to see. That's why when we eventually get into chapter six, which will be probably three or four weeks from now, Jesus talks about giving, he talks about praying, he talks about fasting, and he does this contrast. He says, you know, these Pharisees, they give, but they wanna make sure everybody hears and knows and sees what they're giving. And, and they pray, but they do it so, you know, loud and on street corners so everybody knows and sees. And they fast and they make sure everybody knows they're fasting. He says, and they've got their reward because that's all they're gonna get from that. He says, don't be that way. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, God says, listen, man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And for these Pharisees and these teachers of the law and their righteousness, it was all on the outside. There was all this external compliance. There was obedience. But something was off. Something was incomplete. Something was missing. Now, I've referenced Dallas Willard a lot in this series. Again, his book, Divine Conspiracy. And it's in, in there where he talks about with these Pharisees and teachers of the law that what they were missing goes beyond obedience. It's not just saying and doing the right thing. There's something beyond that. Now, while I've quoted Dallas Willard and referred to him a lot, one of the people that I have not referred to a lot in this series is Nacho Libre. Uh, and some of you don't know who I'm talking about, and that's okay. But in Nacho Libre, Nacho says, beneath the crows, we find the men. And beneath the men, we find, we find his nucleus. And Jesus is saying, you you Pharisees, you have these robes of man-made righteousness and underneath these robes of your man-made righteousness, there's a man, but there is no nucleus. 
There, there's something missing deep down. In fact, when Jesus talks about their righteousness in Matthew 23, look at how, what, how he describes it. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs which, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You look great on the outside, but there's no nucleus. Something's missing underneath that, beyond just the obedience, beyond the appearance of righteousness, beyond just keeping the rules, beyond just saying the right things and doing the right things. Listen, if all you're worried about is compliance and adherence to the law, you will always neglect what's going on in here. And quite frankly, as far as laws are concerned, uh, let's use this example. If it's just a, a compliance to a law in our country, it doesn't really matter what's going on in here. Let's say you get pulled over. You've been driving and you get pulled over. And the police officer comes to the window and you say, hey, was I speeding? I don't think I was speeding. He said, no, no, no you, you weren't speeding. In fact, I've been following you for a while and, and you've actually been driving very, very well. You've stayed within the speed limit. You've stayed in your lane. You've signaled properly. Unlike the rest of humanity, you got in and out of the roundabout in a proper way. Um, you, you braked when the light turned yellow instead of speeding up. I mean, you have done all these things right, but I just, I just perceive that it's, it's not coming from a good heart. I, I feel like you're doing it kind of begrudgingly, and, and your face reflects a lack of joy, and so I'm going to cite you. I'm going to give you a DUA, driving under an attitude. See, that doesn't matter. If it's just about complying to a law, it doesn't matter what's going on in your heart. It doesn't matter your attitude. It doesn't matter your motive. It doesn't matter how you think or you feel about any of it. But Jesus says, we're not talking about traffic infractions here. We're talking about life in the kingdom, life in our world. And what happens in here really does matter. Because otherwise, you're just dealing with symptoms as opposed to the source. In Luke chapter six, we read these words, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. It's not just about dealing with symptoms, not just about Bobby, tell your brother you love him. No, it's something needs to happen in here. It's not just this outward Con, you know, conformity to the law. It's this heart transformation. It's this change that happens right inside of us. And when we understand this, what Jesus is getting at here, this becomes the key that really unlocks a lot of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. As I said, there's a lot in chapter five we are not gonna be able to cover. But there's this refrain. You have heard it said, but I tell you. And what Jesus is getting at over and over again is it's not just about external compliance to the law, it's what's going on in here. For instance, and we'll look at this next week. You have heard it said, you shall not murder. Good enough. The vast majority of us, we're good on this one, okay? And we haven't, and we're not going to. We're, it's, that's, I, can, I can keep to that law. He says, yeah, yeah, but that's not enough. There's, it's beyond obedience, because maybe you've never murdered anybody and maybe you never will, but you can still just harbor bitterness and anger and hatred and contempt. And if you think just by not murdering is enough, you've missed it completely. You're inside filled with all this corruption. Or when he would say, and you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. It's okay, good enough, I'm not. I will not commit the act of adultery. And maybe you don't, but inside you're filled with perverted lust. And he says, you know what? Yeah, you've kept the law, but you've missed the whole point. You've objectified others. You have this corruption inside, and you never address the source of the issue. And even in the passage that is so troubling to so many that don't even understand it, is where Jesus says, you know, if your eye offends you, gouge it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. <laughs> he's, not, he's not advocating for, you know, poking eyes out and cutting limbs off. What he's saying is, listen, even if you poked your eye out and cut your hand off, it doesn't fix the issue of the heart. 
doesn't change the lust. That the point of all of this is that there will be transformation in our heart. That's what kingdom life looks like. That kingdom life with Jesus is not just about sin avoidance and keeping the rules. It's about heart transformation. John Ortberg said this, that you can do the right thing, but fail to become the right person. And isn't that really what was happening with me 50 years ago and my brother? I was doing the right things, saying the right words, the right action of even hugging him, telling him I was sorry, did all the right things, but it wasn't from here. And quite honestly, it's the fact that for some of you, this is the very reason that you walked away from the church, you walked away from your faith, you walked away from Christianity, because all you ever heard, all you ever saw, all you were ever taught is do the right thing, not become the right person. All you ever heard was do these things, don't do these things. No why behind it, just the what. And maybe you saw you saw this modeled. Maybe your parents, your dad, or your mom, or your pastor, or your youth group leader, they did the right things. But you saw that underneath that, they weren't the right person. And for some of you, maybe that's why you walked away. And I get that. And maybe that's why a lot of our world wants nothing to do with those who call themselves Christ followers because we have reduced it down to doing the right things instead of becoming the right people in the righteousness of Christ. Sheldon Van Auken said this, the best argument for Christianity is Christians. Their joy, their certainty, their completeness. But the strongest argument against Christianity is also Christians. When they are somber and joyless, when they are self-righteous and smug in complacent consecration, when they are narrow and repressive, then Christianity dies a thousand deaths. And Jesus comes along and says, listen, I'm inviting you into this kingdom, this kingdom culture. And here's the goal of this, that you and I, that we would become followers of Jesus, living in his righteousness with hearts that are transformed, full of grace and truth. Let me say that again, because that's so different than, than the religion that some of us were raised with or some of you think this is all about. That we would become followers of Jesus, living in his righteousness with transformed hearts, and we're full of grace and truth. That's not what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees were bringing about all these laws and all these rules and all these interpretations and going over and over again. In fact, Jesus said this about them. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. They're just saying, here's what you have to do. Here's what you have to follow. This is what you have to do. This is what it means to be righteous. This is what it means to be right. All this heavy burden. Contrast that when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and, and burdened. I'll give you rest. Learn from me. So I'm humble of heart and gentle in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In the 17th century, uh, there was a, a man, uh, an English writer. He was also a, a Puritan preacher, which if you just say those words, a Puritan preacher, there's a lot of images that come to some of your minds. His name was John, and uh, he's most famous now, you know, these, whatever, almost 400 years later, he's most famous for an allegory that he wrote. It was kind of an autobiography. It's a, it's a story that's referred to as Pilgrim's Progress. His name was John Bunyan, not to be mistaken with Paul Bunyan. That's a different one. John Bunyan. And John Bunyan in his allegory of, of the Pilgrim's Progress, talks about his spiritual journey and, and, you know, and, and laying down these burdens and going through all these temptations. It's, it's really quite fascinating. But there's another little poem that he wrote that I think is absolutely beautiful. He wrote this. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings 
It bids me fly and gives me wings. Ah, the law says work harder, keep running, go after it. I'm not going to help you out. I'm not going to give you hands. I'm not going to give you feet. You're on your own. But the gospel, the good news of the kingdom comes along and says, hey, I want you to no longer run under that burden. I want you to fly and I'll give you the wings. See, what we have to understand is this, that the good news of the kingdom is not a burden to have to bear and try to muster enough strength to do. It's this freedom in Christ that we can fly. So when you're reading the Sermon on the Mount, when you're understanding the kingdom of God, if you feel like, oh, it's just, just so heavy, I just I can never do this, you've missed the point. Because it's not about burdens, it's about giving us wings so that we can soar on the divine thermals of God's grace and just flourish that way, that we can follow Jesus living in his righteousness with transformed hearts full of grace and truth. Jesus said, I have come that they may have more rules to follow. I have come that they may give external compliance to the law. I have come that they may be burdened down So now I've come that they may have life and have it in abundance. What Jesus comes to offer is not just sin avoidance, it's life abundance that he would overflow us with his life that is full and flourishing and flying in his grace. So in Matthew 6, he does say, seek first his kingdom, not the Pharisees' righteousness, but his righteousness And our righteousness is what life looks like when we're living in the reality of the kingdom of God. What if we could not only get this here, but live it here? That we would be followers of Jesus, living in his righteousness, with transformed hearts, not just external compliance, changed hearts, full of grace, full of truth. And we want to end a little bit differently today. And I'm going to ask, uh, don't sign off. Don't click off. Don't get up and leave, no matter where you are. We have Trina sing a song. And I want you not to sing along. I want you to just receive this. I want you to hear these words. Sometimes a song, uh, lyrics, uh, music can reach a part of us that words on a sermon can't. And I want you to just receive this and live in the truth of this song. And then I'll close this in prayer. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted let a rescue begin come find your mercy oh sinner come kneel earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal
Heaven 